Welcome to Lessons in History. The LO today is, what issues did Queen Elizabeth I have to deal with from day one? We will look at how she became Queen in the first place, and why people thought that she shouldn't even be there. The issue of marriage will be looked at, both in terms of pros and cons, and how Elizabeth dealt with Parliament in stopping them from debating this very issue. We will also look at how Elizabeth established herself as the leader of a divided nation, using both the court and patronage to her advantage. This is a content-heavy topic, with several interrelated issues, so it might be best, for this video, to watch from start to finish. But feel free to use the timestamps as always for those extra tricky parts. Elizabeth Tudor was the daughter of Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn, and was the second wife of Henry VIII, with his first wife to Catherine of Aragon breaking down, resulting in divorce. Catherine and Henry did have a daughter called Mary, despite Henry's desire for a son. Catherine of Aragon was both Spanish and Catholic, and Mary, her daughter, wanted to continue this and tried as best she could to restore elements of the Catholic faith when she became queen. Mary, a Spanish Catholic and fiercely proud of her Spanish heritage, deeply hated Elizabeth's mother Anne Boleyn for displacing her very own mother as queen. Equally too, she despised Elizabeth for she was seen as a product of this illegitimate marriage. She also despised Elizabeth's youth beauty and Protestant faith. Mary went on to be known as Bloody Mary for the killing of Protestant heretics, burning nearly 300 of them over five years. Elizabeth's tense relationship with Mary continued until Mary's death. Childless and in poor health, the 42-year-old queen died in 1558. Legend has it that Elizabeth was sitting under an oak tree in the park when informed of her sister's death and handed the coronation ring. To which she replied, This is the Lord's work, and it is marvellous in our eyes. In a spectacular ceremony, Elizabeth was anointed with holy water and crowned queen in Westminster Abbey on the 15th of January, 1559, beginning a reign of more than 40 years. If you are going to inherit the throne, then it is essential that you are, after all, legitimate, which is to have the right to be there. Elizabeth's legitimacy was in doubt because of how her father had divorced his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, in order to marry Elizabeth's mother, Anne Boleyn. Henry wanted to divorce Catherine in 1533 in the hope of getting a male heir as the next in line. Catherine had given birth many times, but only Mary, who would be the heir if all else failed, lived past infancy. Henry wanted a male heir, because he thought a woman could not rule with the same authority as a man. The only way to get a son, therefore, the one he desperately wanted, was to seek a divorce. The issue of Elizabeth's legitimacy, therefore, stems from when Henry sought a divorce from the head of the Catholic Church, the Pope. Catholicism does not allow or recognise divorce, and Henry was forced to break away and create his own church, the faith known as the Church of England. This great event is known as the English Reformation. Now separate from the Catholic Church, and Henry as the head, he was able to grant himself a divorce or annulment, as it became known. Henry went on and got married to Anne Boleyn on the 25th of January 1533, with Elizabeth being born nine months later, on the 7th of September. <clears throat> Catholics refused to acknowledge Henry's divorce because the Pope did not agree to it. Catherine of Aragon was still alive when Elizabeth was born and so many Catholics refused to accept her. Elizabeth's legitimacy is centred around her father's previous marriage and the idea that Catholics do not recognise divorce and therefore the second marriage to Anne Boleyn. In this regard, then, those that supported Mary I would label Elizabeth a bastard. In such a man's world, few really thought that Elizabeth was up to the task of government. Women, it was feared, were weak and not suited intellectually to reign. Monarchs were thought to need traditionally masculine characteristics, physical strength, assertiveness and decisiveness. Queens were meant to be merely the wives of kings. They were supposed to be kind religious and maternal. They were not supposed to rule. It was feared that chaos could be the result of a female leader. Moreover, 
a monarch had a duty to keep their country safe and to further its interest abroad. But Elizabeth could not be expected to lead her army into battle as a king might do. How could a simple woman do this? Those that opposed her thought. As Elizabeth got older, she came to see her gender not as a disadvantage, but as a useful political weapon. It allowed her to charm and manipulate to avoid situations she disliked and decisions she did not want to make. It also helped her create a powerful cult of personality, the Virgin Queen, married to her people, married to her country. However, the issue of marriage was a serious one, and being metaphorically married to the people or country was not enough for some. Marriage was seen as important to strengthening Elizabeth's rule, as it could both produce an heir to succeed her and solidify her position. This became especially urgent to Parliament when Elizabeth almost died of smallpox in 1562, and as she grew older, the possibility of her not having children increased. By 1566, Parliament was so worried they began to openly discuss possible matches for Elizabeth. She was furious about this and banned Parliament from discussing the issue again. A great example to use to state how Elizabeth truly was in control and not Parliament, putting them in place. There were both pros and cons to any marriage. For instance, one advantage would be the creation of an alliance system with a foreign country. Domestically, it could win support of a powerful English family. Long term, any marriage would produce an heir to the English throne, one that was obviously missing at the time. A marriage would also stop any conversation about Mary Queen of Scots taking the throne from Elizabeth. Arguments against marriage would include the idea that if Elizabeth was to marry a foreign suitor, then England would essentially fall under a foreign ruler, such as that of France or Spain. If Elizabeth was to take an English suitor, then what about the other English families? Would they become jealous and a potential threat to her? Any husband could create problems over authority. Would the man try to dominate over the woman? Not getting married, therefore, allowed Elizabeth to keep her independence. And finally, and not something to shy away from, if Elizabeth was to get married, there was no guarantee she would survive any potential birth. Marriage, therefore, was a complicated issue. There were many potential suitors, both domestic and foreign. King Philip of Spain, Prince Eric of Sweden, and of course her favourite, Robert Dudley. Considering what had happened to both her father and mother and the disadvantages of marriage, perhaps it is no surprising that Elizabeth never married. This left the issue of who would succeed her very much in the air, much to the displeasure of Parliament. Structure of government. To ensure her own position as leader of England, it is vital that we understand the apparatus of government and how it was used to control the masses. The government framework, both at a local and national level, for these both had their own areas of control or remit. Everything below the green line is considered local government issues. Everything above the green line and below the red line would be regarded as national government. The driving force for change and who controls and runs the country runs from the centre, emanating away from Elizabeth, who was, after all, above all, with the exception of God, naturally. During the Elizabethan period, monarchs of England believed they had the right to rule by the grace of God. This was later known as divine right. Because of this, Elizabeth I made all of the most important decisions in the country, deciding if England went to war and when to call or dismiss Parliament. Although she listened to Parliament's opinions and took advice from her Privy Council, she could reject them. Elizabeth could reward people with land, a title, or supporting their cause. This was called patronage that we will look at later. The court was a body of people who lived in or near the same place or house as the monarch. The court was made up of many members of the nobility. They were the monarch's key servants, advisors, and friends. Attending the court required the monarch's permission, and they were required to entertain and advise the monarch. As such, they could influence and persuade the monarch to take action in their interests. The Privy Council was made up of leading advisers, as well as nobles and very senior government officials like Sir William Cecil. There were approximately 19 members of the Privy Council in the early years of Elizabeth, chosen by her. They all met at least three times a week and debated current issues and made sure the monarch's final decisions were carried out. Finally, they ensured that the remaining sections of government worked efficiently. Each county 
had a Lord Lieutenant chosen by the monarch. They were members of the nobility and were also on the Privy Council. They were essential to maintaining the monarch's power and England's defences. They were in charge of raising and training the local militia of soldiers and overseeing the county's defences in case of England being attacked. They ensured that the Queen's laws were enforced by people far away from central government by giving orders to justices of the peace. These justices of the peace were unpaid, and they reported to the Privy Council. Being a JP was a position of status, and so was a very popular job. They made sure all Elizabeth and Parliament social and economic policies were carried out by local people. For more serious crimes, JPs also acted as judges in local courts every three months. Other wings of government and control by Elizabeth included obviously being the head of the church, appointing key individuals such as archbishops that would in turn be in charge of appointing the 9,000 parish priests around the country. We'll go into looking a bit more detail in Parliament later, but in essence, Elizabeth could call and dismiss this institution as she saw fit, and they were mostly called to raise taxes. Court life and the Privy Council. The Privy was made up of key advisers, and it was important to have the right people around Elizabeth. Elizabeth had reduced the council from 40 to 19 members, but kept a lot from Mary's Privy Council to avoid alienating key individuals. She was also careful not to appoint any strong Catholics. The Privy Council was small, highly efficient group of educated professional full-time politicians, largely from the gentry or landowning classes. By far, the most important appointment Elizabeth made was one of her first, William Cecil. Their successful working relationship lasted until his death 40 years later. He had the position of Secretary of State and later the title of Lord Burley in 1571. Elizabeth relied heavily on Cecil, counting on his loyalty and trusting him completely. Elizabeth was careful to balance competing interests within the Privy Council, as men after all were very ambitious. She even executed two members, Norfolk and Essex, for treason. It was common for her to appoint rival factions so they both would compete for her affection, provide her with contrasting advice, which would allow in turn for her to make a more measured and informed decision. One could argue this is a way of Elizabeth dividing and ruling her nation. Elizabeth used a system of patronage to ensure her own position and by the loyalty of others at court. This involves showing favouritism by giving particular men important jobs. She managed this very carefully. She gave her male courtiers political roles and equally careful to give key politicians places at court. The jobs given were highly sought after because they brought not only wealth but also prestige to the individual. Although it was a highly corrupt system, it was very effective. It caused intense competition and rivalries between people. This suited Elizabeth very well, because it made everyone totally loyal to her. It also ensured that the court remained a political centre and made sure that Elizabeth remained at the heart of the whole political system. Progresses were a way of taking the court on tour and showing her face around the country, and this would typically happen during the summer months to the homes of the nobility. It had the added advantage of reducing the cost of the court, for the bill was foot by the noble or host to whom the court would stay with for a period of time. It has been labelled as a major public relations exercise, which allowed Elizabeth to be seen by her subjects regularly, building up a relationship with her people and to flatter the noble she stayed with. To the subjects that saw this grand procession of over 400 wagons piled high with clothes, linen and documents, Elizabeth I must have seen as a goddess. Parliament The monarch decided when Parliament should meet and for how long. Parliament was called if the monarch needed new laws to be passed or wanted to introduce new taxes. In total, during Elizabeth's reign, 13 sessions of Parliament were called, and in all but two of these, Elizabeth asked for more taxes. On almost all occasions, Elizabeth received what she asked for. MPs in this time were growing in confidence both in their own individual intellect and collective power. Elizabeth, therefore, had to be extremely clever in dealing with MPs. 
they would frequently try to exercise their supposed right to a free debate, bringing up religious issues or the question of marriage with great frequency. Elizabeth, in response, was to anoint a speaker of the house that would control which topics were discussed. Order! Order! She would also at times attend sessions so that her personality might influence or bully MPs into the way that she wished them to think. Elizabeth imposed limits on MPs' rights to speak freely and not shy away from imprisoning awkward MPs, such as Peter Wentworth, who went on to be imprisoned in 1576 for arguing for MPs' rights to free speech. Elizabeth would also have her members of the Privy Council sit in both the House of Commons and the House of Lords, providing a way for the government to control and manipulate parliamentary affairs. William Cecil was a regular. Thanks for making it to the end. i put some practice questions up should you wish to give these a go. Leave any questions or comments that you have if you're unsure of the content and what you would like to see next. Remember, these videos are here for your benefit, so if you like the video, then you know what to do, and if you didn't, then tell me how I may make them better. What do you think was the main instrument Elizabeth used to secure her power? Why do you think people opposed her? Was it because of her issue of legitimacy, or the fact that she was a female? I'd be curious to hear what you think in the comments. Thanks for watching Lessons in History, and I'll see you in the next